Hi there, I'm Colleen Corrigan Day. I hope you can spend Sunday mornings with Jerry Quinn and me. Tune your radio whk.com from 10 a.m. to 12 noon or log on to whkradio.com. We have archive shows and we also stream live by clicking the listen live now. Live local bands are a regular feature on our radio show. I love taking phone calls and emails from all of you and all of our friends around the world. Our website is Quinn irishradio.com. Don't forget now, Sunday mornings with Jerry Quinn and me, Colleen Day. Hi, I'm Eddie Fitzpatrick. Been doing the Jerry Quinn show for 30 or more years. Been right here from almost the start. And I just want to welcome all of you people here to the Jerry Quinn show. So anyway, welcome, Judge, uh, Justice, actually the right way to say it is, uh, uh, Supreme Court, Court Justice Peter uh, Charlson is with us this morning. But well, we're going out for convenience, we're, I'm going to address him as Peter, and we leave out uh, other fancy stuff. So welcome to the program, it's great to have you with us. It's great to be here, it's great to be here. Now here. first I must congratulate you on your performance, our wonderful perfor performance at the Collins and Scanlon's uh, event the other day. Uh, not only was your speech eloquent and wonderful, but your singing was excellent also. You beat out all the other judges. That well, I, I, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. I, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell them that. And Adrian Hardiman, God rest his soul, he couldn't see, he was a great man, but he couldn't sing. Nobody could sing like you. Judge Kelly wasn't bad. No, uh, Peter Kelly's pretty You know good. him, right? <laughs> no, I know him very well. As, as I understand, he, he sang Molly Malone. Molly Malone. Yeah, yeah. Now, with that song that you sang the other night, what was that? Okay, that was a song from the 17th century by uh, Padre O'Darnine called Melagon Dovo, which means my lovely small jewel. It's a song in praise of his wife, which I sang for my wife Fiona and all the other wives of all the people that I've interacted with, Tom Scanlon's wife, Tim Collins' wife, and all the other lovely Irish-American people I've met and the other American people I've met on my trip here to Cleveland. That wife of mine was very impressed with you. Well, she's a hard lady to impress, and I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> Kerry women are like that, you know. Oh, well, I guess. <laughs> They're very difficult to impress. But now, now I'm going to get on to business with you here. We have a lot of things to um, talk about, but how long have you been a lawyer? A lawyer now? Okay, well, it's funny. The system in Ireland is odd because you don't have to do a primary degree, or at least when, when I was doing it, you didn't have to do a primary degree. You go straight into law school. Out of high school, out of college. Out of, out, of, out of high school, yeah. And then you, you go and you qualify. And then to become a practicing solicitor or a barrister, you've got to do a professional qualification. In my day, you could do the professional qualification straight away without having a law degree, which is what I did. And then I did a law degree later. So at the age of 23, I was actually a qualified practicing barrister which is a trial lawyer in American terms. But that's, not, that's what a solicitor then is what compared to a barrister? Yeah, well, the, the idea is that barristers are admitted to the bar and they speak in court. Solicitors, of course, can speak in court as well. But we are supposed to be specialist advocates. We're supposed to know how the judges think, how to put a case across, and we're supposed to spend our time researching um, the appropriate legal topics of the day. Could you describe for our listeners the rankings? We uh, start off as a solicitor, and they, you know, a, a judge we say in a local town. Okay. And where does it go from there? All right. Well, the system isn't all that complicated. Like um, the United States of America, Ireland would have counties. So, as you know, there's 26 counties um, south and west of the border, and within those counties there are district courts. Um, typically, each county would have one or two districts. So that's the district court and in terms of criminal business they sit without a jury so it tends to be the less serious criminal stuff so it could be some case, small level drug dealing for instance or assaults which don't have serious consequences. Then above that several counties are grouped together into what's called a circuit and the reason it's called a circuit is the same as a racetrack. It's because the judge goes around from place to place and sits in various towns and t in, in those, typically, the judge will sit with a jury and do criminal cases. And then to make things more complicated in the criminal sphere, you have the High Court as well, which is jurisdiction only in relation to rape and in relation to murder. 
But both of those, the High Court and the Circuit Court, sitting with juries, get appealed to the Court of Appeal, and there it ends. And it's only if there's a point of law which is of general public importance that the case would ever go to us into the Supreme Court, which is where I sit. Now, civil jurisdiction is a bit similar. The High Court has full original jurisdiction over the whole country. The Circuit has jurisdiction up to, I think, about 70,000 euros. That's as much as they can award. And there's a lesser amount then for the district court uh, civil jurisdiction. So that's how it's organized. Where is the um, courts, the High Court and the Supreme Court located in Dublin? The Supreme Court has taken over since 1922 what used to be the Court of Appeal for Ireland. So it sits in a lovely wood paneled building straight in the middle of the four courts on the Liffey. It's a building that everybody will see and you can't help noticing it if you're in Dublin. And the High Court similarly will sit there, but the High Court also goes around and does, does appeals from the circuit uh, around the country two or three times a year. And then, the, and then um, the circuit courts sit in the various towns. They wouldn't the, go to the smaller towns, would they? Uh, no, uh, they wouldn't. They go to the big towns like Limerick, the capital towns. Like, like Cork, like Galway. Um, actually, more recently, the Supreme Court has just sat in Limerick. And two years ago, we sat in Cork, but that's a development. The idea is if there's an important case from that area, we'll go down and we'll sit there so that people can see us and, and, and see whether we're doing a, a good job. Do you ever go to a giant town like Ballina? Yes, actually, Ballina is an important circuit is venue. It? Yes, it is. But in terms of County Mayo, the place where the High Court sits is Castle Bar. The capital. Principally, the reason for that is you've got a lo lot of old buildings, so you've got to revamp the stock and it's where the stock has been revamped and there are two good big courtrooms that the High Court will sit, the Circuit Court will sit, where there's one courtroom, similarly the District Court will sit where there's one courtroom. Uh, do you um, recognize the name John Philpott Curran? I bet you do. I, I absolutely do recognize the name John Philpott Curran. When, when I was a, a, a young barrister just qualified, um, I actually got a book of his speeches and I used to read them every night and try to develop the extraordinary eloquence which he had. I studied the trial of the Shears brothers, other trials that he'd been involved in, his technique of cross-examination. Um, of course the tragedy of John Philpott Curran was that his daughter became involved with Robert Emmett and the, the insurrection of 1803 and uh, well, to put it mildly, the two of them didn't get on at all. I have two books of his speeches. Problem is, the type is so small, I'm almost blind after reading one page. Uh, that is the problem, and some, someone should revive that actually and, and, and get a, a modern book of his speeches out because really his eloquence, his, his ability with the English language was extraordinary. I'd, I'd, I'd put him in the same category as Shakespeare actually. Considered a lawyer's lawyer. Huh? He was a lawyer's lawyer, but like a lot of these great advocates, he wasn't really all that interested in law. He was much, much more interested in fact, in persuading people about things. And he had a real way of actually connecting with a witness. If a witness was not telling the truth, he'd find out where the weakness lay. And he would not seize on that weakness in any rude way, but he'd simply get the point and deal with the point in such a way that the witness began to trip himself up. Kind of a Perry Mason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, uh, America has produced great lawyers as well, yeah. All right, uh, we're going to come back, I want to come back and talk to you about Brexit. We'll have a chat about that. And then we'll come back and talk more about the law. You can stay with us a while, right? Okay. Good man. Delighted. Talk about something that is very important, and in fact there was shockwaves throughout the world when Brexit occurred last year. And uh, Peter, they haven't resolved that much. About Brexit, huh? No, they've resolved very little, and I think the problem is that um, you know the way lawyers negotiate. I mean, people like Collins and Scanlon would be experts in this. You meet your opposite number, you treat them with respect. What you say to each other takes place behind closed doors. The problem with this is it's megaphone diplomacy. One side is shouting at the other side, the other side is shouting back, and very, very little is getting done. And what is the thing now, Gilman? He says mostly lawyers, isn't it? lawyers and accountants, right? Would you say? All of that's very important. Generally, the way these things work is that uh, diplomatic services have people they call Sherpas. As you know, Sherpas bring you up a mountain, but that's what they call the people who go ahead prior to the minister arriving in a city. 
to meet with his or her counterpoint, the Sherpas will have worked out the vast majority of the detail. So far, vis-a-vis -vis Ireland, we've worked out a couple of important points, but the detail of that is going to be the most important aspect of it. Now, Britain is Ireland's largest import. They import from Ireland a lot of goods and services, right? There is a huge amount of uh, cross-border interactions. Just to take a couple of examples, we sell Britain food worth five billion a year, while they sell us food worth about three billion. We export 90% of the food that we produce, and 37% of this goes to the United Kingdom. Um, beef, for instance, is worth about 2.5 billion annually. The counterpart is that Ireland is not rich in energy. The United Kingdom isn't rich either, but it does have an interconnector to, for instance, uh, Siberian gas. So we get a lot of en our energy from them in around the 70% mark. So it's like a marriage. We keep, they keep us warm at night, and then we feed them. Hmm. Hmm. That is like a marriage. Well, sometimes. Some marriages. What do you say to that, Mrs. Day? Yeah, sometimes. Would right. you agree yeah, with that? that Are right. you home cooking dinner, bre breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the man that keeps you warm at night? Sometimes one of them. <laughs> with the food. With the food. Right. One of them. Why do you mean? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, so. If this Brexit takes effect, and I hear there are rumors now that some people are trying to backtrack, but let's say it goes ahead, what will that mean? Will there be import duty then between Ireland and the United and, and, and Britain? This is a, this is going to be a horrendous problem. I mean, as as you know, Jerry, going back, uh, Irish people in England were not treated as aliens. Similarly, the British have a right to vote in our country. It's a long-standing agreement to try and keep things calm between the two countries. But vis-a-vis -vis interactions, well, just take the border, for instance. As you know, the border takes, uh, cuts around about one-sixth of the island of Ireland, which is called Northern Ireland. That's 280 miles long, and there's 180 road crossings. About 20,000 to 30,000 people cross that border in vehicles every single day. Now, if you're going to introduce a border, if you're going to start introducing import taxes, well, there's going to be real problems. Because since the advent of the European Union, since the free trade area that we've had since 1948, the entire two economies interact together. Can I give you just one example? Mm -hmm. A lot of us like to have a Baileys. Okay, it's a really important, it's a popular product. Baileys collect from 1,500 accredited dairy farms on both sides of the border. The milk is transported to the Glanbia processing facility on the southern side of the border in Virginia County Cavan. That's about 5,000 border crossings a year and involves 4 to 5 percent of Ireland's total milk production. The cream is then taken off the milk and it's transported to Dublin and to Molusk County Antrim. That's the northern side of the border. And in Molusk, in the north, the cream is blended with whiskey, and 70% of Bailey's Irish cream is sold worldwide, and that's where it comes from. So you can see the extraordinary interaction between the two sides of the island. Of the island. So, it's complicated. No question about it. It's very, very complicated. So where have we got to in terms of the Brexit negotiations and Ireland? Well. The most important thing is a declaration which is called paragraph 11 of the draft negotiating guidelines, which the United Kingdom government have accepted. And that says, and I'll quote, in view of the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, flexible and imaginative solutions will be required, including the aim of avoiding a hard border while respecting the integrity of the European Union legal order, which means that the European Union is determined and the British have agreed to do everything they possibly can to avoid the kind of situation that you have, for instance, even between two such friendly countries as the United States and Canada, where you have to stop at the border, where things have to be checked and where sometimes there are long lines. That just would become impossible on the small island on which we live. How about the, uh, the people that are talking now about reversing it? Nigel Farrar was one of the people I believe that instigated this, was he? He, yes, he was, he was very much a strong advocate. I mean, if you, if you go back on the history of this thing, it, it's, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, the, the, the very, there's, a, there's a rump of the Conservative Party in Great Britain 
which basically was always opposed to Europe. The idea was, we the British are surrendering our sovereignty. But look, the Italians have surrendered their sovereignty. The Irish have surrendered their sovereignty. We've all surrendered part of their sovereignty. But they don't like that. So to keep his own party calm, this is at least one of the theories. I, I can't say that I'm an expert. What they did was they said, OK, we'll have a referendum. Now, the British were not used to referendums. Now, you'll know from going to Ireland back and forth that we have referendums on our constitution virtually every two or three years. We've had referendums on judges' pay. We've had, had them on abortion. We've had them on gay marriage. We can't, as a Supreme Court, just change the law. We don't look at things like that. You instead, yeah, instead, it's put to a vote of the people if there's going to be any fundamental change. But in Great Britain, they don't have referendums. Any fundamental change to the European treaties, we need a referendum, again, a vote of the people. The British had one back in 1975. So David Cameron promised Parliament that there would be a new and changed relationship with the European Union. But unfortunately, he went away and he negotiated and he came back with very little. Now, if you read Tony Connolly's book on Ireland and Brexit, which is actually a great read, he'll tell you that one of the things that happened was that prior to the referendum taking place in Great Britain, David Cameron came over, he sat down with the Taoiseach and a Kenny, and he said to him, so how do these referendums work? They've no experience, as I said. And I looked at him and he said, well, you know, David, it'll work like this. It's not going to be about the proposal you're putting to the people. It's going to be about the latest political crisis that's happening at that time and whether people like you or not. And that's the danger with it. A referendum ceases to become focused on the issue and it becomes about the politics of the day and that's how people vote. And the rest, as they say, is history. Apparently, Cameron smiled when he was told that. Well, he's been taught a big lesson, possibly to the detriment of uh, a lot of us. So how will, the, how will it affect the rest of Europe, Britain's relationship with the rest of Europe? You see, Ireland is, a, Ireland is part of the common market, part of the European. How will it affect countries like Italy? Will it be the same almost as with Ireland? But here there's, there's a problem. There's, there's, about, there's three models. You could have a model which says Britain is outside the customs union. That means the same as Canada, United States. You have long lines, all the goods have to be checked, all the goods have to be declared. Britain could go within the customs union, but they don't want to do that. Or they could go even further and stay within what's called the single market. Now, the single market means this. For instance, take milk. Ireland produces about 5% of the world's baby formula. We export to the United States. We export to China. All of those countries have bodies which certify that the kind of baby powder that comes from the European Union is fit for human consumption within those countries. So once you're within the European Union, you have the clout to sell your product to these other large markets. You have the certification, you have the checks. Once you go outside it, you have to negotiate your own agreement and you have to assure those people that the product you're sending over, whether it's car tires or whether it's baby formula, is actually fit for purpose. So the European Union, although it costs money and it takes sovereignty, does that negotiating on behalf of the 28 countries of Europe and gives them a good deal in terms of exports. Okay. Move on. That any country can leave the European Union. I mean, it's not like a totalitarian regime. You can come, you can go. Joining is very difficult. You have to re reach certain economic criteria. You have to give certain guarantees. You have to be in the Council of Europe. You have to accept the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights. Then you get in. You have to make a contribution. Europe will contribute to the, I suppose, revitalization of the poorer regions in your country. It's a two-way street. So, unlike a marriage, it's actually very difficult to get into, but like a marriage, it's very, very difficult to have a divorce out of it, and it does have consequences, and each side will probably have penalties, financial, usually. How about a country like Hungary, for instance, and I think it's Hungary, that uh, wants to limit the immigrants coming in now? How does that work? Well, the whole thing of migration, of course, is, is a very difficult situation. Yeah, Europe, as an economic entity, is, is a very successful. There's half a billion people living on basically the most expensive real estate in the planet. Um, there are places where states have failed. Um, they're pretty obvious. I don't need to name them. 
where people have a desperate need to get out and a desperate need to be rehoused and to start a new life. Now, I think everybody in Europe is in favour of new people coming in, and we have obligations under the European Convention, under the Refugee Conventions, to take people in and to rehome them and to retrain them as citizens. In addition to that, of course, you have the migrations across the Mediterranean, where the Italians and the Greeks, they take the bulk of people coming in, and then it's a question of how do you deal with that? Well, the numbers involved, uh, I think it was 700,000 uh, in one particular year where it was the maximum, compared to the population of Europe of 500 million is actually reasonably small, but it's something that requires careful handling. Now, there was an attempt at a Europe-wide uh, agreement, Ireland did join in it, whereby those people who are coming in and need to be rehoused within Europe and to lead new lives should be shared equally on a per capita basis between the countries, but some countries don't agree with that, and they're not obliged to agree with that, because the European Union is not like the United States of America. It is still an agglomeration of nation states, each with their own governments, but cooperating together. But it's frightfully costly, isn't it, to house these immigrants, house them and educate them, make them productive members of society? How do you do that? Well, I suppose I can only speak from my own experience. Back home, for instance, uh, my son's involved in karate and one of his pals is uh, from Albania. Now, they came to Ireland in a truck when his pal was about four years of age. Um, they're Albanian Muslim, but they went to the school system. The great advantage of Ireland is the primary school system, the secondary school system, the university system is effectively free. And that entire family have turned into highly responsible Irish people, which is exactly what you'd mm -hmm. expect. And they had a really good attitude. And that kind of influx, just as the Irish in America, brought creativity, brought community, brought our own qualities, such as pride in nation, to the United States of America. I think the immigrants who've come into Ireland are also bringing that. You see, for instance, Jerry, if you're going around County Clare or County Galway, um, people who have originally come from Africa are the sons and daughters of people from Africa and hurling outfits, carrying hurleys, playing Gaelic football. It's not easy, but it's certainly something that's well worth making an effort about and I think so far we possibly are, are doing all right. Okay. We're coming up on the top of the hour and then we'll be back and I want to tell you all about our
that any country can leave the European Union. I mean, it's not like a totalitarian regime. You can come, you can go. Joining is very difficult. You have to re reach certain economic criteria. You have to give certain guarantees. You have to be in the Council of Europe. You have to accept the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights. Then you get in. You have to make a contribution. Europe will contribute to the, I suppose, revitalization of the poorer regions in your country. It's a two-way street. So, unlike a marriage, it's actually very difficult to get into, but like a marriage, it's very, very difficult to have a divorce out of it, and it does have consequences, and each side will probably have penalties, financial, usually. How about a country like Hungary, for instance, and I think it's Hungary, that uh, want to limit the immigrants coming in now? How does that work? Well, the whole thing of migration, of course, is, is a very difficult situation. Yeah, Europe, as an economic entity, is, is a very successful. There's half a billion people living on basically the most expensive real estate in the planet. Um, there are places where states have failed. Um, they're pretty obvious. I don't need to name them. Where people have a desperate need to get out and a desperate need to be rehoused and to start a new life. Now, I think everybody in Europe is in favor of new people coming in and we have obligations under the European Convention, under the Refugee Conventions to take people in and to rehome them and to retrain them as citizens. In addition to that, of course, you have the migrations across the Mediterranean where the Italians and the Greeks, they take the bulk of people coming in and then it's a question of how do you deal with that? Well, the numbers involved, uh, I think it was 700,000 uh, in one particular year where it was the maximum, compared to the population of Europe of 500 million is actually reasonably small, but it's something that requires careful handling. Now, there was an attempt at a Europe-wide uh, agreement, Ireland did join in it, whereby those people who are coming in and need to be rehoused within Europe and to lead new lives should be shared equally on a per capita basis between the countries, but some countries don't agree with that and they're not obliged to agree with that because the European Union is not like the United States of America. It is still an agglomeration of nation states, each with their own governments, but cooperating together. But it's frightfully costly, isn't it, to house these immigrants, house them and educate them, make them productive members of society? How do you do that? Well, I suppose I can only speak from my own experience. Back home, for instance, uh, my son's involved in karate and one of his pals is uh, from Albania. Now, they came to Ireland in a truck when his pal was about four years of age. Um, they're Albanian Muslim, but they went to the school system. The great advantage of Ireland is the primary school system, the secondary school system, the university system is effectively free. And that entire family have turned into highly responsible Irish people, which is exactly what you expect. And they had a really good attitude. And that kind of influx, just as the Irish in America, brought creativity, brought community, brought our own quality, such as pride in nation, to the United States of America. I think the immigrants who've come into Ireland are also bringing that. You see, for instance, Derry, if you're going around County Clare or County Galway, um, people who have originally come from Africa are the sons and daughters of people from Africa and hurling outfits, carrying hurleys, playing Gaelic football. It's not easy, but it's certainly something that's well worth making an effort about. And I think so far, we possibly are, are doing all right. Okay. We're coming up at the top of the hour, and then we'll be back. And I want to tell you all about our group.